Hey, we all know that books can carry us away from everyday cares and worries and then take us to another place. But you've been speaking, Michaela, to someone who has a scientific interest in the healing power of books. Yeah, I am. I want to introduce you to PhD candidate Elizabeth Wells and the fascinating research she's doing into the healing power of being read to when you're undergoing chemotherapy. She's seeing really positive results. But I must say that bibliotherapy isn't just for people who are physically unwell. It has an application for all of us. I'll let Elizabeth explain. Okay, in a nutshell, it is reading for therapy. It's looking for therapeutic benefits of reading. So there's a few different forms it takes. One is, for instance, um, self-help nonfiction books. Uh, and Wales, for instance, has a national policy um, of books on prescription. So you might go to your GP with some mild to moderate anxiety or depression. They write a prescription that you take to your library and the librarian will select from this little set of books that psychologists have pre-approved. And that's your prescription. It's amazing. How long have they been doing this for? Oh, some years. What, the what? UK is ahead of us. Why aren't we doing, doing this? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> um, the UK, they have the reading agency. They have the reader. They're both not-for-profit groups that are promoting bibliotherapy and getting great results. Um, Australia, it's little known. Even working as a librarian for years, I was only at a professional development day. I came across, oh, bibliotherapy. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I did um, a little bit of reading on bibliotherapy online, as you'd imagine, yes. and I did see uh, a quote that an ancient Greek library in Thebes had inscribed in the stone above the entrance, healing place for the soul. Correct. So it yes. sounds as if people have known in their gut for a long time that books are very mm. healing, but taking that holistic approach to medicine, it sounds like people in Europe are doing it, but, but we're not yet doing it here. Correct. That's mm. true. The other main stream of bibliotherapy that I'll mention because it's the most relevant to my study is using fiction. Mm. Um, and that's th mostly through identifying with a character and then you get catharsis and healing from it um, only because it is relevant to a range of mental health conditions. For my program, it's a little bit different. It's more to do with solace and distraction, which you would expect from uh, if you're going through chronic pain or through COVID as well. Studies found that people were reading for distraction and solace during COVID mm. to help them get through. So what is your area of study? What is the title of the thesis that you're working on? Okay, the, the big title is an exploration of the potential benefits of read aloud programs to the well-being of cancer patients undergoing treatment. So reading aloud to cancer patients for therapeutic reasons. Correct. And it's reading aloud because from the time of tumour growth, and it's made worse by treatment, chemotherapy is the worst, but all treatments have this effect. Um, there's a condition commonly known as cancer fog. And the technical name is cancer-related cognitive impairment, and it affects a variety of things to do with the frontal lobe. So executive functions, concentration, reading to yourself, navigating, you're losing your train of thought halfway through a conversation, searching for a word in your brain and you can't find it. Um, it's very upsetting for people experiencing it. So I noticed people going through cancer treatment lost this ability to read, not all the time, but often enough for it to be seen as a pattern. So the reason we're reading aloud is because it uses a different part of your brain that is less affected by cancer and cancer treatments. The theory behind reading aloud to people is that they have got brain fog, so they, they're not really as equipped to read to themselves. Correct. But also that the actual act of hearing someone else read to you is also therapeutic. Absolutely. There's that warmth of human connection because we do it face-to-face -face, mm -hmm. unless somebody is um, remote or interstate and then we do it over Zoom. Um, and that's more than you'd get from an audio book, I imagine. Audio books therapeutic? There's been no studies, um, so I can't really say yes or no. However, I'm a big advocate for audiobooks. I'm a big advocate for, you know, reading full stop, obviously. And if audiobooks are ticking the box for you, I've had a couple of participants from my study who I've suggested they move on to audiobooks when we finish our program. And um, I know some have. That, that's really yeah. great advice. So you were talking about how you're, you're passionate about having people read, be it someone reading to them, reading to themselves or audiobooks. Mm -hmm. So what's your background? Where does your passion for this topic come from? Okay, I've had a few different careers in my life. 
And Which makes you a good researcher, I'm sure. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I actually started as a computer programmer, believe it or not, and working for a big organisation, you know, retrenchments come through and I retrained to become a secondary school teacher, teaching IT, mostly maths, a few other things. But one of the things I was teaching as a little school was English. And I just said oh, at the time, yes, yes, I can read, write and speak. I can teach English. But when I had these, they were year sevens at the time, oh, no, we don't go to the library, we don't read. And what, what do you mean you don't read? You know, I didn't understand how you would not read. I championed the Premier's reading challenge in my school and one girl said, my mum says I don't have to do this. And I said, but why wouldn't you want to do it? just couldn't understand. So in my role teaching English, I got my students back into libraries. And when I saw my students, I'd started off reading again at Year 7, at Year 10, at lunchtime, I still remember vividly this group of girls arguing about which of the vampires, remember the Twilight oh, series, yes, which yes. vampire's character they were going to marry. I thought, I've won. <laughs> they're reading <laughs> and they're them. enjoying it, yes. So from there, I progressed into an interest in working in libraries and getting literacy out there again and promoting reading. Um, and so it just seemed a natural progression. And then working in libraries, when I noticed the pattern of people going through cancer treatment, often losing the ability to read, that's when I contacted the university here because I had done my master's here remotely. And I said, you know, I've noticed this. What do you think? We love it. Apply. You know, let's, let's do this. So where's so, your studies taking you? I'm getting a huge kick out of it. Every time I have one of my particularly my um, like my metastatic cancer patients who are quite unwell and they're laughing at something I'm reading. Oh, it feels so nice. It really Absolutely. does. Yeah. yeah. And what results are you seeing? You, we've talked about emotional. Is it, is there, are there physical benefits of being read aloud too? Now that's a really interesting question, Michaela, because something unexpected has come out with a few people so far and that's to do with quality of sleep, which awesome. wasn't something I was looking for, but I've had a few people now come back and tell me, I slept amazingly last night after the session or yesterday actually I was reading to a lady and she said, I don't want to be rude, but I struggled to stay awake. And I thought, oh, I'm boring. <laughs> but for her, because she's quite anxious, naturally she's going through a horrible experience with her cancer. She just got immersed in the stories and relaxed and she went and had a big sleep. Her sleep was not interrupted for a change through anxiety. And also, I suppose if you're getting better rest, it could maybe be because your pain management has been enhanced and you're not maybe not as aware of your pain. Actually, Michaela, yes. Um, the people who are experiencing chronic pain, I do ask them because we do an exit interview at the end um, and sometimes they volunteer it during the program as well that it's taken their mind away from their pain. Yeah. yeah. And what sort of books are they reading? What Are there certain books that get a better result than others? It's a six-week program, so we're together for about 45 minutes once a week for six weeks, and I choose material based on what they've told me they like. Um, it's usually short stories because mm. that way we can cover one or two in that period of time for each session rather than trying to remember what happened last week in the novel. I had one gentleman extremely unwell, and can I mention actual titles? Yeah, yeah? love okay. you too. So Kitty Flanagan. For instance, this gentleman, this particular day, he he was not at all. In fact, he was in bed. I actually went in his room and read to him and he laughed and laughed at Kitty Flanagan. And um, sadly, he actually, that was my last visit with him. He passed away and his wife was so appreciative. Um, I was thinking of some other mm -hmm. comedies, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or um, Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. Mm. That, they would, they're light and funny True, yeah. but we need yeah. bite-sized. That's the only thing. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so it does. So that's where poetry and short stories uh, mm. are beneficial. I get a big kick, as I said before, out of hearing my participants chuckle. And bookish humour is a very individual thing. Not everyone will chuckle at the same things. Some people will be quiet until the twist at the end and go, ah, and then they laugh their head off and others will laugh throughout. And I was thinking about some funny ones to mention today and I thought about Sophie Kinsella, I've Got Your Number and that's something I listen to as an audiobook and it's hilarious because it's a series of text messages but when it's read to you it sounds like dialogue, very funny dialogue. So humour is very individual and I know I had a participant request some PG Wodehouse 
and I had never read any before. And it's either silly or it's hilarious and really, really good. <laughs> so your, some of your research participants are broadening your reading perspective. Correct. Isn't yes. that nice? Yes. And I'm broadening theirs too. Mm. For instance, reading a lot of Jeffrey Archer short stories. I didn't realise he was so good at that. Maeve Binchy is having a big resurgence in my program. <laughs> Anna Jacobs as well. Monica McInerney is very popular in my program. So she, I've, I've read a few of her mm. books, but she, um, does she, so she does shorter books as yes. well. Yes, oh. and some very clever ones. <laughs> Can you think of any titles? Ah, oh, there's a really good one called Hippie Hippie Shake. <laughs> that, oh, that's the short story. Her, it's in a collection called All Together Now. Very popular. Men and women. I read some of these stories too, and um, everybody laughs at it which is really good. And I I will mention one of my favourite books. It's called The 13th Gift by Joanne Hoost-Smith. Despite me praising fiction so much, it's a narrative non-fiction. It starts with a tragedy, which is doesn't sound like I'm recommending it. However, the whole remainder of the book is uplifting and it's healing and it's eye-opening and thinking we can all change the world in little ways. Um, it's almost like a recipe book for making others feel better. What else? I, I, I pre-read everything before I read it to my participants to check for appropriateness. Like there was a book of Aussie yarns and um, like oh, there's this one I read and it was called A Pauper's Funeral. And so normally I wouldn't touch a topic like that with my group, but um, this particular gentleman, his wife had told me that he went to see a stand-up comedian making fun of cancer treatments and he laughed his head off. So I told him at the start, you know, this is, it's set around a funeral, but it's really funny. Is it? Yep, go for it. And he loved it. It's very funny. That's um, Bill Swampy Marsh wrote that. So what do you hope can be achieved with your research? I have a huge hope, Michaela, that we can show a positive result, say bibliotherapy helps in this context and go to cancer centres and say, please let me help you set up a a bibliotherapy program, Um, specifically a reading aloud program, only because I have seen people struggle to do it for themselves. I don't see any point just giving someone a list of books and saying, these will be good, you know, off you go. (laughs) But on that note, the UK, we mentioned the reading agency earlier, they do have lists of mood enhancing books on their website. Oh, who is this? What the reading agency? The reading agency. Okay, They're a UK not for profit group. Amazing work they do over there, and they also have a couple of lists where um, cancer patients have nominated books that they found helpful at the time. They have another good series called Quick Reads. The reading agency has sponsored those, so it's some really good authors that you'll know. But they've written. Um, books that are about 100 pages long. I also noticed uh, in my short amount of searching on the internet, bibliotherapy with the State Library of Victoria. Have Mm -hmm. you come across that resource? I have, yes. What are are your feelings on it? I think it's great. Yeah. Um, um, You know, they did a couple of series during COVID because Melbourne was so locked down and the whole idea was to take you out of your head for a while into another place. Some great resources there. They are. And another that might also fit the bill for people who want to be read to is a new podcast I've just found called Women Read. In each episode, different everyday women choose a book they love and they read the first chapter aloud. There's all sorts of accents and approaches and I absolutely rate the one where Stella, one of the volunteers, reads Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. She really should be a professional actor. Oh, what a fun way to be introduced to books you might want to go on and read more of to yourself later. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You've been listening to Tsundoku, the podcast for addicted readers or readers who can't actually get to their bed for all the books that are beside. (laughs) 